Hello everybody, this is Brian James from Rhino3D.com and in this Rhino tutorial I'll be going over the Grasshopper plugin. So Grasshopper is available on Grasshopper3D.com and after you run that installer you will have a Grasshopper command in Rhino. And this is what it'll look like. The Grasshopper canvas will pop up and the Grasshopper canvas has a whole bunch of tools that are similar to the tools that you'll find in Rhino but it's another interface for creating objects in Rhino. So in this beginner tutorial we'll cover making some simple shelving units to give you an introduction to one way that you can use Grasshopper for industrial design or product creation. So we can double click the top of the Grasshopper panel and that minimizes and maximizes. So the first thing I want is some curves to reference in Rhino. So regular old Rhino will make a curve from center and this is going to be a rectangle and this will represent the profile for my shelf as seen from the top view. I'll then make another rectangle that represents the vertical leg as seen from the top view and I'll copy this from a mid snap to a mid snap like that and then I'll mirror this across Y. We'll also need another rectangle that represents the support which is underneath each shelf. And I'm not too concerned with how big any of these curves are at the moment, mainly because we can always resize these or change them or reference new curves. The power of this is going to be that the grasshopper definition is going to control the shape of our shelving unit. Okay, so uh, these curves here, the supports, I'm going to group those together, control G. And for the legs, I'll do the same, grouping those together just to help me select them later. And now we're ready to start referencing these in Grasshopper. So one thing I like to do, especially if you're on a, a single screen, is to drag off the perspective viewport so you make a floating viewport, and then drag it off to the side to make it half the width of your screen. And that works on um, recent versions of Windows, Windows 7, and I think uh, Windows 8 does it, that same thing as well. Otherwise you'll manually have to resize it. And now I'll go into the params tab. So the params tab has a geometry section and that is a whole bunch of components, that's what these are called, that are looking for certain types of stuff. So I want the empty curve component here. And I'll need two more of these, so I'll use Control c Control v to copy that two times. And you see how they're orange? This is a color cue that tells me that they're missing some something that they want in order to do uh, do anything. And if you mouse over the little uh, note bubble here that pops up, it says that there's uh, no data in it, failed to collect data. So we can associate this curve in Rhino with this component in Grasshopper in a couple different ways. You can either right click over the component and choose set one curve and Grasshopper will go away for a second and you're prompted in the command line to select a curve. And then when it comes back you can now see it's this light gray color which means that it is referencing an existing curve. And if I highlight the component, the corresponding curve or the reference of it becomes green. Now the other way that you can do it is you could select the group then right click over the next empty curve component and choose set multiple curves. And this allows for group selection if you do it this way. Okay. Now the next thing we need to do is rename these so that we don't get confused because right now they're all the exact same name. So you can right click over that and we can say that this is the shelf curve And for this one, I'll say this is my leg curves. I'll put an S at the end of this because there's more than one. And this is going to be my support curves. Okay, so the very first thing that we'll do is we'll make the shelf here. And the navigation of the Grasshopper canvas is exactly the same as Rhino. I'm just using right mouse button and either uh, control or the scroll wheel on the mouse. 
Okay, so we're going to first make a planar surface. From the surface section, I'll grab planar SRF. You can also double click on the canvas and just start typing and it'll auto complete, but there's a whole bunch that begin with plane. This is the one you want, planar, planar SRF. And it has two sides to the component. There's an input on the left side and an output on the right side. So just mouse over it and it'll tell you what it wants. It wants edge curves. So you left click and drag your curve into there. And that now makes this light gray, which means it has enough data to produce something on the right side of the component, which is the output. And you can mouse over that and see there's one surface that's created there. Next I want to make this surface an extrusion, and you can do that with the extrude component. And the extrude component is twice as complicated as the planar one. It has two inputs. There's a desire for a base curve or surface and also a direction vector. So a vector is the complicated part here. It is both a length and a direction. So first we'll put the surface into B, but it's still orange. It still needs more information. It needs that D input. So I'll go over to the vector section and I'll grab a unit Z. So this is the Z axis. And what that does is it gives me an extrusion, a solid extrusion here, based on this planar surface in the Z direction. But how high is this? That's controlled by the factor. So the factor for the Z vector component is by default 1. And we can put another number in here with a number slider. So I'll go to the params tab, grab a number slider, and drag that in here. And now dragging this number slider controls the height of the extrusion. Now as you move along in Grasshopper going from left to right, it helps to hide things upstream so that you just see what is downstream. And this will help uh, decrease confusion later. So if I highlight by left clicking the planar component here, planar surface component, I can hit the space bar and click on the little icon with the guy with the blindfold. And that hides the planar surface output. And so when it's this dark gray color, it means you can't see it. You could still bake it out. Baking it out means um, creating a regular old Rhino object from it, but you can't see it right now. All right, so something that I'd like to talk about with the number sliders is that you can double click where it says slider and we can rename this. And that's also a good idea here so that we uh, don't get confused later. So this will be shelf thickness and a little bit about number sliders here. You can change how the number slider works. If it says floating point, which is the default, you'll have a decimal place. And if it's on N, it'll just be whole numbers. And even and odd are also options. The min and max are the limits of the number slider. So if I know that my shelf can never be smaller than a quarter, whatever my model units are, and never greater than two, then I can set the min and max appropriately there. And if you double click right on the number slider, you can just type it in directly. Okay, so I'm going to now move the shelf up in the Z axis, and this will allow us to create more than one. So if I go into the transform tab, Euclidean section, I'll use the move component. And the move component has two inputs. It wants base geometry and it wants a vector. So which direction to move it in? So that's what I want to move, and I'll reuse my Z vector here, control copy, control paste. And I want to control the distance, the space between the shelves separately, so I'll need another number slider. And I'll double click this number slider and change it to, say, shelf spacing. And I'll say it can never be greater than 12, and it can never be less than 5. And I'm just making up those numbers. And now you can see that the moving is related to this number slider. 
Now keep in mind that these, this component references the initial extrusion and this component represents the moved version of that extrusion. So as you keep going from left to right you create copies of copies. Now this is all well and good, but what if I want to make more than one shelf at a time? You could realistically make multiple versions of this assembly. More Z vectors, more move components, and move every uh, additional moved shelf. But that doesn't make quite as much sense as making a series of numbers and having that series represent the number of shelves. So I'll go into Sets, Sequence, Series. And series has three inputs, so just take it slow and mouse over the left side and see what it wants. It wants the first number in the series. It wants the step size, so how much does it count each one? And how many times does it count is C, the last one. So my initial number and the step size will both come from this number slider. And then we'll need one more number slider and I'll change this to integers so it's just whole numbers and I'll say it can never be greater than 8 and never less than 2. And this I will call a number of spaces. And that'll go into the count for the series. And now if this goes into the factor for the z vector, now we have the ability of making multiple shelves and controlling the spacing separately. And now the move component has three items in it. And if you mouse over the output g, you can see that there are three closed b reps. And a B-Rep is a boundary representation. They are just closed poly surfaces, as Rhino would call them normally. OK, so next I want to take the leg curves, and I want to extrude them to the height of whatever my top shelf is. And so we'll do this again in the exact same method with a planar surface, a z-vector, and an extrude component. So I'll control copy, control paste, and drag these down. And then I'll replace the input for the curves to right there. And so you can see right now the z vector is controlling the height here of these extrusions. So it's exactly the same height as our shelf thickness. But I want it to be the height of the total assembly, so however many shelves I have. And I can get that number really quickly with some simple math because I have the shelf spacing and I also have the number of shelves, or the number of spaces rather. So if I multiply these two numbers, I get the height, or close to the exact height that I want. So I'll go into Math, Operators, Multiplication, and it's a really simple one. We'll multiply our shelf spacing times the number of spaces. And if I drag that into the factor for the z vector, then my leg extrusions go right to the bottom of the top shelf. And this may be what you want, depending on how the shelving unit is put together. But I actually want my legs to go to the very top of the top shelf. So I want it to take into account the shelf thickness. So I'll use an addition component and I'll add the result of the multiplication to the shelf thickness. And that result will go into the factor for the z vector. And now you can see that the legs go right to the top no matter what the shelf thickness is, or how many shelves we have, or the spacing between them. Okay, so it's a good idea to organize your definition so it's readable. Uh, we know at this point we're going from left to right, but here's a couple things that'll help you um, keep things 
legible as you continue to make this definition denser and denser. Have enough space between things so that you can see where they come from and where they connect to. You can also drag a fence selection over a whole bunch of objects and you can justify them to the left and equalize the spacing. And really this is user preference. Um, but try and keep it as legible as possible. It'll help you later on. Now the next thing I need to do is make extrusions for the support curves and move them so that they are right under the top of each shelf. And we'll start this in the exact same way with planar, surf, Z vector and an extrude. So control copy, control paste and drag that collection down and replace the support curves there. But I want to control the thickness of my supports separately, so I'm going to take a, another number slider, a new number slider here, and make this uh, support thickness. And I'll say it can never be less than 1, and it can never be more than 6. And again, I'm just making those numbers up. The unit that you're using in the Rhino file is what this number relates to. So you can change these or change the template in Rhino to change what the actual dimensions of the product are. Okay, so the support thickness is set. And now I'll move these so that they're underneath each shelf. And let me make um, just one more shelf here. There we go. So if we use a move component, and I'll just grab a new one here from transform Euclidean move. This will be the geometry to move. And the direction to move it will be based on the uh, series here that we have. So if I drag this down into here, which is controlling the shelves, you can see what happens. And let me uh, actually hide the preview of these just so I can show you what's going on here. So look at what happens when we take all these different support curves and we move them off of the value in the Z. We get these. And what's happening here is that each one of these, so these are the original ones. Let me hide these. This will make more sense. What's happening here is that each of the four supports gets one of the numbers from the z vector here. And what we want to happen is for each of the four supports to get each one of the numbers, not just one of them, so that we have four at every level. And the way you can do that is by using the graft component, which is in sets, tree, graft. And you can right click over the graft component and read the help file on it and this will explain what exactly the graft component is doing. The flatten component is uh, essentially the opposite of the graft component. So I'm going to drag the Z vector output for the series into graft and then drag that into the move component. And now you can see what happens. Now it's correct. So let me redisplay the shelves like that. So the only problem is that the supports are actually going in the wrong direction. So one of the really nice things about ve uh, vectors is that you can reverse them. So under the vector section, vector panel, there is a reverse vector. So I'll just throw that in between here. And now we have the supports coming from the bottom of every shelf. Now one last thing that I want to do is I want to take the legs and I want to cut the shelves where they intersect. And I also don't think that I want a shelf at the very bottom. So that is this here, so I'll just hide the preview of it. So these are the legs and these are the shelves. So I'll go into the intersect section and do a solid difference. Solid difference. 
This is what I want to cut, it goes into A, and this is what does the cutting, goes into B. And I'll hide the preview for the original shelves so that I'm just left with the result. And I'll drag these over so that I know exactly what to bake out at the end of my modeling here. Now these curves that we referenced in the very beginning, and I'll just zoom out so you have um, the full definition here as I talk about this, these curves are referenced in these empty curve components for shelf curves, leg curves, and sport curves, which means that we can go back to regular old Rhino, turn on the control points, and start control point editing to update the entire definition. The only rule that I have to maintain here is that these curves remain planar. If they suddenly become not planar, then it'll break the whole definition. So if I take this one curve point and drag up, I can no longer make the planar surfaces. But I can undo, and now it works again. And I have my leg curves and my support curves here. If I ungroup those, and then turn on the control points for those, I can move back or scale just the center there. So if I wanted the center support spine to actually be shorter so that I had more shelf space in the middle, we can do that that way. And anything you do to this curve, so for instance if I run the fillet command, like that, I can round that edge and it updates the grasshopper definition. So the last thing to tell you about is the concept of baking. So if you select a whole bunch of components in grasshopper, the corresponding objects in Rhino highlight green, and then you can hit the spacebar and click on the baked egg icon. And that makes regular old Rhino objects, which now you can select in Rhino. And you can move that around, and it's completely unconnected from, from the grasshopper definition at this point. Now to save the file, if you wanted to save the grasshopper file, do that from the file drop-down menu in grasshopper, and this will save a GH file. The GH file will reference object IDs for a Rhino file, so if you have a corresponding Rhino file, also save that 3DM file and open both in unison. And that's an introduction to making some basic shelves with Grasshopper for Rhino. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.